Now let's discuss cardiovascular emergencies. Remember that cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the United States. It kills over half a million Americans every year. So it's one of the number one reasons why EMS is called, and it's something that we can correct as long as we are able to assess properly, could give good diagnostic treatments like 12 leads early and make decisions to go to the most appropriate facility because science now has really changed in the way that we treat patients with chest pain and cardiovascular issues. So 34% of all U.S. deaths involve heart disease. And you can see all the modifiable risk factors of heart disease. Prevention strategies are important, not just for your patients, but for you as well. I mean, think about um, behavior modification and smoking cessation to lipid management, um, aerobic exercise, issues like that. So let's review the structure of the cardiovascular system. So you need to have a pump, pipes, and fluid. The goal of the cardiovascular system is to deliver oxygen and nutrients to cells. It does that by having and maintaining a good pressure. The heart is about the size of a closed fist. It's going to circulate between seven to nine liters of blood every day. The outermost layer of the heart is known as the epicardium. That's the protective layer. The functional layer where the, the cardiac cells are located is the myocardium. And then the endocardium is another inner protective layer. So between the endo and the epi, it's protecting that functional myocardial tissue. And you can see how it's set up. It's it, the myocardium in the center is fed by the coronary blood vessels. The epicardium has that, um, is encircled, of course, by the pericardial space, and the pericardial sac and fluid inside. That allows it to beat freely and without rubbing up against another organ. We have the superficial layer, known as the parietal pericardium, and then the inside layer is called the visceral pericardium. Of course, we want to avoid any abnormal fluid collection because it's going to put stress on the heart, compressing downward. A small amount is a pericardial effusion, a large amount is a tamponade. A tamponade is going to have physiologic signs. So what bathes them are the coronary arteries. We have the, the right and left. The left coronary artery supplies the left ventricle, the septal wall, and part of the right ventricle. The right coronary artery supplies the right atrium, the right ventricle, and goes all the way to the part of the left ventricle. And you see here, those are the two arteries that provide the blood supply for the heart. There are connections between arterioles that allow for something known as collateral circulation. And this, this provides for complete and total um, perfusion to all myocardial cells. Now that's important because they're only getting it from two main sources, the right and left coronary arteries. From there we have the coronary sulcus and, and blood drains into the coronary sinuses that get dumped right into the right atrium for dropping into the right ventricle and pumping up to the lungs for oxygenation. Now we have four chambers. We have top chambers of the atria and the bottom chambers of the ventricles. They are separated by valves known as atrioventricular valves or AV valves. The right side is the tricuspid, the left side is the bicuspid. I always remember that because if you follow the flow of blood, you always try before you buy. At the, let me just jump back, I'm sorry. At the uh, ventricles, we have much stronger semilunar valves. These valves actually open up during systolic wave when the, when the left ventricle contracts and pumps blood out to the arteries, either the pulmonary artery on the right or the aorta on the left, and then it shuts closed. And unlike these AV valves, the tricuspid valves 
can uh, hold back more pressures. They can withstand greater pressures. And they're rated for pressures of about 140 to 150 millimeters of mercury. So, of course, we know that the resting pressure or diastolic pressure is, is actually putting pressure against these semilunar valves. So reduction of diastolic blood pressure will reduce these valves from having to overwork and hypertrophying and having something like congestive heart failure. So the cardiac cycle, this is the complete depolarization and repolarization. Depolarization is a passive process. It happens with channels opening up and allowing ions like sodium and, and calcium to invade and change the polarity of the of this cardiac cell to cause a muscular twitch. And then repolarization is an active process of pumping out that excess sodium and, re and getting back the potassium that it had lost during depolarization. So while we're repolarizing and the cells are actually working to pump out this fluid, this is the relaxation phase of the cardiac cycle. And this is known as diastole. This is when um, we have our resting pressures. Now we need to have those atria working effectively because they will maximize the amount of blood that the left ventricle is pumping. So atrial kick is that initial sound one or lub in the lub-dub sound one, sound two process of, of a heartbeat. So that lub, boop, you're forcing, you're, you're contracting and pushing any blood that didn't drain into the left ventricle, it's kicking in, it's maximizing our stroke volume. As the ventricular contraction starts, the ventricles actually contract, the semilunar valve opens, and blood is, is shot out into the arteries. So because the right side is only going to the lungs, but the left side is going to the fingers and toes, the left side is a high pressure pump, where the right side is more of a low pressure pump. And you can follow this blood flow, I'm sorry, blood flow through the heart. Blood that's entering into the right atrium is known as preload, the stretching that results from this um, increase in blood can increase the preload. If you want to decrease the preload, you reduce the amount of blood that's going into the right atrium. Afterload is the blood that's driven out of the heart against systemic artery flow, known as peripheral vascular resistance. So there are two circulations in place. You have the left side, which is systemic, pumping through the entire body. That's the high pressure left side circulation. And then you have the right side, which is pulmonic, low pressure, because it's only going to one organ. It's just pumping blood right next to the heart, the lungs. And this is a, a slide that demonstrates that process. So that's how the pump works. Now, in order for the circulatory system to work, it needs to be a closed container system. And the container is comprised of the blood vessels. Then we have two main types of blood vessels. We have our veins and arteries. And the arteries are under high pressure, where the veins are more of a low pressure. So arteries have more structures to make sure that they are able to um, work and deal with the stress of a high pressure container. So you look at an artery, common structured artery, you have your tunica adventitia, that's the outermost lining, more of a protective sheath, connective tissue. Then you have your tunica media. Your tunica media is your smooth muscle. And this is the functional area of the, of the vessels that constrict or dilate. Then you have your tunica intima, which is connective tissue protecting that smooth muscle. And then you have your epithelium. The epithelium are, are squamous cells that um, are, they take the brunt of the pressure and any particles pounding against it. 
in order to protect. It's kind of like the armor. It's like the, the tiles on the space shuttle, all right, or pawns on a chessboard. They are there to protect the important structures, and they can be replaced very easily by the body. So the blood vessels are designed to be that passageway for blood to make it to the tissue. They are under the control of the autonomic nervous system. And as you know, the autonomic nervous system is the involuntary nervous system, and it's divided into two different types. You have the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, the fight or flight or the feed or breathe. Blood pressure is regulated by the control of these two or the stimulation of these two types of systems. Parasympathetic blood pressure is going to be a little more relaxed and blood vessels are going to dilate, blood pressure is going to drop. Sympathetic, we're going to have a stress response, we're going to have an increase in blood pressure because we'll have an increase, we'll have a narrowing of the vessel. Pusoil's law, when we talked about that earlier, talks about when you constrict, you increase pressure. Unfortunately, you reduce flow. We'll talk about that later during hypoperfusion. So these vessels have the role of getting them down, getting blood down to the tissue. They have to have enough pressure in this closed container, enough resting pressure to allow for systolic flow to occur, and you have perfusion into the tissue for oxygen to carry across and be used for aerobic metabolism. And then inversely, CO2, which is a waste product of aerobic metabolism, to go into the vessels to have their journey back up to the heart. And here's a map of your blood vessels. The goal, the function that I just described you have to have that closed container pressure. In order to do that, you need to have good output. In order to have good cardiac output, you need to have good stroke volume or how much blood is in the ventricles that can be pumped out. Heart rate determines how the, out, how the cardiac output is going. If you have a lot of stroke volume, let's say you are a professional athlete, marathon runner, and your left ventricle is so well toned and defined that you are pumping out double the amount of blood that a normal person does in every stroke, your heart rate doesn't have to be a normal heart rate. It can be lower because the cardiac output is being performed with a very high stroke volume. Now, ejection fraction, this is the percentage of blood that gets out of the heart with each contraction. Normally, we have between 85 and 90% ejection fraction, which means that 10 to 15% of blood that's in the left ventricle stays there every time the left ventricle pumps. It needs to do that for continuing pressure. You can't completely empty it, the cylinder, the container. So, understand, cardiac output, is reliant on stroke volume and heart rate. And in order for us to maintain good cardiac output, we need to balance this equation. So if normal cardiac output is, let's say, 5,600 cc's, and our stroke volume is 70 cc's, each time you pump, you pump out 70 cc's of blood, then our heart rate's got to be 80. Okay? Now, if you suddenly have a drop in stroke volume, let's say it drops down to 60, your heart rate is going to increase in order to compensate and maintain normal cardiac output. So if it's down to 60, your heart will increase to 90 beats a minute. 9 times 6, 54, we're within the ballpark. Now, like I said earlier, you have some people who are professional athletes. They're in such great peak physical shape that they're pumping out, let's say, 150 cc's of blood. So their heart rates only have to be about 40. 
to achieve that normal cardiac output. So there's a balance between the two. Stroke volume can be increased in different ways. We have the Dr. Frank, Dr. Starling mechanism, which says as cardiac muscles are stretched, it contracts with greater force. This is what happens with professional athletes and how they can develop that as they increase their contractility, they'll increase their stroke volume. What's going into the pump is important because it's going to affect how the pump the stroke volume going on the way out. So more blood is drained when more oxygen is demanded. When we have a higher demand for oxygen, we will end up pumping more. We'll stretch out the right side because we'll increase blood flow to the lungs and allow for more capture of oxygen. With this constant stroke volume, if stroke volume is a constant, cardiac output can be increased by increasing the heart rate. This is known as positive chronotropy. Now cardiac cells, they look like skeletal muscle, but they're involuntary. Unlike skeletal muscle, which is under conscious control through the somatic nervous system, cardiac cells are under involuntary control through the autonomic nervous system. Cardiac cells have the ability to be excitable on their own, or through impulses. They can twitch on their own, or twitch by an impulse. If they don't get the impulse, there's an internal timer that will twitch on its own. That's called an escape mechanism. Another thing that cardiac cells have is conductivity. They can pass their electrical stimulus to other cardiac cells. So if you look at a cardiac cell on a microscope, it's beating on its own. And you look at another cell on a microscope, it's beating on its own. But if they touch, they beat together. That's conductivity. Automaticity, generating their own electrical impulses. And that's where the escape rhythm kicks in. Cardiac cells are set for an escape beat of 20 beats a minute. So if they don't receive an impulse within three seconds, they will start beating on their own. Or they're designed to start beating on their own. That's where you see escape rhythms. And the ability to contract, just like skeletal muscle, that's known as contractility. So all these cardiac cells, they're all merged together, and they are on a timer for an escape beat of 20. But we can't live on a good cardiac output with a heart rate of 20. So we rely on the pacemaker, the cardiac conductive pathways, to stimulate that that uh, electrical stimulus that will cause the cardiac cells to be above their normal pacemaker rate. And the dominant pacemaker of the heart, of course, is the SA node, the sinoatrial node. And it, when it signals, when it actually emits a electrical stimulus, it travels down a network. This is the internodal pathways. It's communicating with the AV node. So it's going to send a message to the AV node, and you can see how it travels down the internodal pathways. And it, it travels across the right atrium to the left atrium and comes to rest at the Bachmann bundle. And you see that it stops there. But the other areas, the thoral tract and the Winkiebach tract, end up landing in the AV node. So the AV node then gets stimulated, and it carries the impulse down the bundle of His to the Purkinje, down the bundle branches and up the Purkinje fibers. And that's the impulse. And as it's sending that impulse down, all the cardiac cells that are right up against that, those fibers are now gonna be excited and depolarized. And then through conductivity, the cells next to them will depolarize, and so on, and so on, and so on, and we get this pumping action that occurs. First starting up at the atria, and then the ventricles. So the SA node, electrical impulse move down to the AV node. That's the goal. Now the AV node is going to wait until that signal is sent, but it has an internal pacemaker that's set at a slower rate than the SA node, and that's one of the first fail-safes. 
that AV node, we have the James fibers and the neural pathways and the Mayhem fibers that extend down into the ventricles that lead to the bundle of Kent that can cause early depolarization. So coming off of that AV node is where we start the ventricular contraction. In situations where the atrial rate becomes very quick, then we use those bypassing pathways to increase ventricular response. We don't wait for that, for that AV node to fire. What happens is it all gathers together into the bundle of Hiss, the right and left bundle branches, and into the Purkinje fibers. So that period of time when this wait at the SA node, that's known as the PDR interval. So a lot of times in tachycardias, what you will see is the decreased PR intervals. And that's due to the fact that the impulses are going to go, are going to involve the AV node, but they're also going to bypass the AV node with alternate pathways. So depolarization is muscle fibers are contracting. And this is regulated by sodium and calcium levels that are increasing, causing a more positive polarity of the cardiac cell that will result in the actual twitch. So the cells normally will receive this signal, this electrical signal, to open up their sodium channels through the internodal pathways or the other cardiac cells that are right next to it, who received it right before them. Depolarization will then spread and you'll have that contraction. So we're going in a depolarization state, we're at negative 90 millivolts. That's our resting state. The electrical impulse causes the sodium to open up, and you can see that, that squiggly charge line. So here we are at negative 90, squiggly charge line, opens up the sodium channels and increases the polarity until it reaches positive 90 and triggers that depolarization where we then are at this positive 90. Muscular contraction, we have the twitch of the cardiac cell, and now we're at that positively charged state. But we can't stay in that positively charged state. We need to clean out that excess sodium and calcium. And during depolarization, we've lost some potassium. The channels have opened up and potassium has diffused out. So we want to get that potassium back, but we also want to pump that sodium out. And since we're going against diffusion, we need an active transport process, and that's the sodium-potassium pump. So the sodium-potassium pump kicks in, and we start to slowly pump out the sodium. And as we're pumping out the sodium, we start to go negative, 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 negative. And you can see this repolarization thing as we go down, down, down. And we finally hit the resting state of negative 90 that active transport. You can see from depolarization phase is very fast and repolarization phase is very long and requires the most energy. During this period when the cells are repolarizing, this is called absolute refractory period. They need to be at a complete resting state in order for the sodium channels to open and for the, the calcium to work and the and sodium to work and the potassium to get out, we have to be at a normal state. So that's the um, relative refractory period when we're partially repolarizing. Absolute refractory is when we completely depolarize. We're at positive 90, that's it. We can't have another impulse. Or we'll have something called an R on T phenomenon, which can result in overexcitability of all the cells, V-fib, and complete chaos. And, of course, death. All right, so all this is regulated by that SA node, sending that signal. And the, the intrinsic rate of this pacemaker, this dominant pacemaker, what makes it dominant is that it fires before anybody else. Okay, so it's, by firing for anybody else, it overwhelms it. So the SA node fires between 60 and 100 beats per minute. That's the, that's the normal intrinsic pacemaker rate. The AV node and the AV junction, the rate is between 40 and 60. And then finally, the Purkinje fibers and cells are at the default final 20 to 40, where cardiac cell will beat on its own. That's once every three seconds. Okay, and that's the final failsafe. 
So let's look at this. We can measure, or we do an electrocardiogram, we're actually looking at the electrical activity of the heart. Has nothing to do, doesn't tell us anything about the mechanical function. This is just the electrical depolarization, not mechanical depolarization. So what do we, what do we see? Well, at the beginning of the, the P wave, we see the SA node firing. And the time it takes to get to the AV node will be that period of atrial depolarization. And that's shown by a P wave. The atria are depolarizing. As the atria are depolarizing, hopefully we have atrial kick. This is when the, this is when the um, atria are compressing down and pushing blood into the ventricles. I say hopefully because once again, EKG does not show you mechanical function, just electrical activity. Now, as it gets to the AV node, it's going to pause, and that's the PDR interval. And then it's going to travel down the, down the bundle branches. And remember, Eindhoven's triangle, our right shoulder is a negative lead, and our left, um, our left chest is the positive lead. So the impulse of the heart is going from negative to positive, and that's why as it's going down the bundle branches, it's a positive deflection. As it comes up the Purkinje fibers, it's a negative deflection. Now while that's happening, that is ventricular depolarization down the bundle branches and up the Purkinje fibers, shown by the upward QR and RS downward deflection. While that's happening, the atrias are repolarizing. So while the ventricles are depolarizing, the atrias are repolarizing. We don't see that on an EKG because it sees the more dominant electrical impulse, which is that ventricular depolarization. But buried in that ventricular depolarization is the atrial repolarization. So once the ventricles have depolarized, now the process is repolarization. You can see that the T wave represents ventricular repolarization. Look how it's longer, more pronounced, it's, it's wider and longer lasting than that QRS. Why? Because it's a faster response depolarization and repolarization takes a lot longer. So once again, P wave is depolarization of the atria, P interval is depolarization of the atria from the delay in the AV conduction. The QRS is depolarization of the ventricles. While the QRS is happening, the atrias are repolarizing. The ST segment is the start of ventricular repolarization. The T wave is the actual repolarization. And then the R to R is the time between ventricular depolarizations or the resting state of the ventricles. Here's a nice slide to review what it looks like mechanically. This is what you can hope for as long as you have mechanical function and atrial contra and, and electrical contraction, you have a normally functioning pump. So once again, talking about the autonomic nervous system, the, the nervous system itself is broken into two main categories. You have the system that is under conscious control, also known as the voluntary or somatic nervous system. Then you have the involuntary or autonomic nervous system. It's not under your conscious control. It's what the diagnostic sensors of the brain use to regulate and, and even out and have homeostasis. And we have the two types. We have our parasympathetic and sympathetic. Fight or flight, or I'm sorry, sympathetic is fight or flight, parasympathetic is feed or breathe. If you've got sympathetic response, 
it's either it uses alpha stimulation and beta stimulation. Where do you find alpha receptors? On the smooth muscle of the arterioles. Where do you find beta receptors? Well, we break them down. You have beta 1 receptors on the heart and beta 2 receptors on the lungs. Remember your spinal column that protects your spinal cord. The parasympathetic nerves, primarily the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, controls parasympathetic response. It's going to connect to the SA node, and when stimulated, it's going to lower your heart rate. It's going to reduce the excitability of the sinoatrial node. Now, your sympathetic nerves, through release of norepinephrine as well as epinephrine, will create what's called an adrenergic response to the cardiovascular system. Stimulation of alpha causing increased systemic vascular resistance, increasing your, blood, your diastolic blood pressure. It's going to cause beta stimulation in the heart, increased heart rate, in the lungs, bronchodilation. We're also going to have a cholinergic response and you're going to have increased sweating. It's also going to have a dopaminergic response which will cause the renal system to reduce diuresis, retain fluids. What can stimulate this vagus nerve? Well, pressure on the carotid sinus, straining, called as a valsalva maneuver, and distension, the hollow organ, like the stomach. If the brain wants to slow the heart rate, it, it stimulates through the vagus nerve. It causes a release of acetylcholine, which hits the targeted organs and causes that parasympathetic response. So you can see through the vagus nerve controls the SA node. It has a direct connection. So the, the brain and through the medulla and the tenth cranial nerve can control the heart rate. Sympathetic nervous system is a more of a reflex style. Um, it's going to adapt to the changing demands. It's very sensitive to pressure changes, the kidneys and at the carotid arteries. If there's suddenly a, a period of hypoxia, the brain suddenly is not getting its enough oxygen, it triggers a sympathetic response. It sends messages to the to the nerves of the heart through stimulus of the sympathetic nervous system through the production of adrenaline, release of adrenaline, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. And remember, drugs that affect the sympathetic nervous system, you've got your alpha and beta drugs. These are known as sympathomimetics, epinephrine, albuterol sulfate. These are drugs that mimic sympathetic tone because they activate the beta receptors on these cells. And you see a drug like isoproteranol or isoprel is a pure beta agent. It's an extremely strong beta agent. They used to give it for asthma. We used to administer it during cardiac arrest to cause excitability, increased chronotropy and increased inotropy um, in a cardiac arrest asystole setting. Phenylephrine is a pure alpha agent, and what alpha receptors do on the, on the arteries causes vasoconstriction. Coyle's law says increase vasoconstriction increases pressure, but you give up flow, so you have reduction of flow with increased pressure. Beta one cardiac, beta two pulmonary.
Now, if you give a drug like a beta blocker, like propanolol, indorol, labetalol, it's going to block those receptors and not allow a beta stimulus to go on there. Beta blockers are dangerous because they get in the way of sympathetic tone. So that's why if you give a beta blocker to a patient who has asthma, there's a real risk if they exacerbate an attack, you're not going to be able to treat them, not even with epi, because the beta blockers are not going to allow uh, those receptors to accept drugs that are going to cause a sympathetic response. So the major autonomic agents that we use, we have the atropine, which is a parasympathetic blocker, and by blocking parasympathetic tone, you flip into sympathetic tone. And that, that will cause the heart rate to increase. Norepinephrine is a pure sympathetic agent, and that's going to have beta, alpha and beta qualities. So we're going to have an increase in not only systolic, but diastolic pressures. Isoproteranol is used for um, dilating bronchioles and causing increased inotropy and chronotropy, beta agonists. Epinephrine is a, is a naturally occurring catecholamine. It's a, it is a sympathomimetic if given artificially by IV injection. Dopamine also deals with sympathetic tone with the renal function. We give albuterol, which is a beta-2 agonist, so it doesn't have as much effect on beta receptors in the heart. It's more of a profound bronchodilator. But don't give propanolol for these patients because albuterol will be blocked. So propanolol instead is given to patients to slow down a heart rate, and it's something who it's it's a it's a drug that's useful for patients who um, are having cardiovascular compromise, acute coronary syndromes, to reduce the oxygen demand on the heart. Homeostasis and hemostasis is the ability to maintain body balance. And hemostasis is the ability to maintain blood pressure. You got to have pressure in a closed container. It's always got to be under pressure in order to make good perfusion. So blood pressure is cardiac output at systolic force times peripheral vascular resistance, diastolic pressure. So coming across a patient in cardiovascular issues. We want to assess them by asking them what their chief complaint is. Common complaints are chest pain, but also shortness of breath because the cardio, cardiovascular system is closely in touch with the respiratory system. In addition, we can have neurologic issues like fainting, but you can feel palpitations and fatigue. Always make sure the scene is safe, of course. Look for clues to identify any other potential issues. Form that general impression. Look at your patient. How are they presenting to you? Determine that level of consciousness. What's their airway and breathing? What's the pain, airway patency? Check for their rate, quality, and effort of breathing. Remember, when they're elderly, they may not have the same neurologic systems in place, so they won't feel that crushing type of visceral pain that you would find with that textbook type of patient. But if they're just short of breath, that's, some, that's somebody you need to assess their cardiovascular um, system, and we do that through a 12 lead EKG. Oxygen, always good. We talked about it during respiratory. Always make sure you increase your oxygen percentage to um, allow for a better disassociation curve. Check for a pulse, check radial carotids, and here's a, a little pointer for, for you newer medics. If you Check for a pulse. Patient is conscious, they're a little short of breath, and you can't feel a radial pulse, put them on a the monitor. So chances are they're going to be in a tachy or brady dysrhythmia, and you'd like to take care of that early. Get a history. Use the OPQRST. When you have a patient who is just short of breath, find out when it started. Has it been sudden or gradual? Have they been coughing up anything? What color is it? Is there any activity that brought this on? When cardiac output drops, suddenly fainting can occur. Especially when you get older and you can't compensate with a sympathetic response. If you've ever been 
laying on the couch and somebody calls you on the phone, you have to jump up to get it, you suddenly feel that head rush, that's from a decreased cardiac output from a sudden environmental change, an atmospheric change, and you just suddenly get a little uh, dizzy and then you feel better. But when you get older, you don't have that ability to compensate as quickly. So find out what they were doing when they suddenly collapsed. Palpitations, it's a sensation of normal fast. It can be caused by dysrhythmia, it could be caused by anxiety. The only way you're gonna find out is through a proper assessment. Very big thing, patients feeling a sense of impending doom, that is a real clinical sign. Now medications for patients that have different cardiovascular issues, well, DIG preps, uh, these are for patients with chronic dysrhythmias that usually are atrial fibrillation in nature. Um, but these, these have a very narrow therapeutic threshold and they can build up toxic levels pretty quickly which can cause cardiovascular compromise. Patients who have angina take anti-anginal agents and the number one we have is a nitrate like nitroglycerin or isosorbide. Isosorbide is longer lasting where nitro is short acting. Interesting story but Viagra was originally intended to replace isosorbide as a long acting vasodilator that can relax coronary arteries. But of course, during the human trials, clinical phase, they found that 95% of the male subjects were having sustained erections lasting at least two hours, and that's when they decided to move away from the cardiovascular arena and go into the erectile dysfunction business. So this is why patients who are on erectile dysfunction medications um, can have a potentiation of nitroglycerin. They both come from the same arena. Other drugs that we give for anti-angina are beta blockers, put less of an oxygen demand on the heart by lowering heart rate. But you gotta watch for this because you know these patients could have a sudden drop in cardiac output, blood pressure. Calcium channel blockers like um, dilatiazem, verapamil, cardizem, these are for usually um, atrial tachycardias, atrial fibrillation, um, atrial flutter, things like that. Once again, drop in cardiac output, low blood pressure can be a result of toxicity. We have our antidysrhythmics that do different things with the, with the heart, with cardiac cells or the um, pacemaker cells by uh, blocking calcium channels or sodium channels so you have to be very careful. These also have um, very narrow therapeutic threshold levels. Diuretics used for fluid overload helps excrete both sodium and water, but it also has a potassium depletion aspect. And this, having less potassium as well as less sodium can have cardiovascular effects. Antihypertensive med medications are just what they sound like. They are used to treat chronic hypertension. These, once again, are chronically used. We don't use them pre-hospitally. It's dangerous to address a hypertension pre-hospitally and have a sudden drop. You can end up with what's known as a watershed reaction and um, a stroke as a result. So, we want to be very careful doing that. These are more chronic medications that are given to patients and they can build up levels and they can affect cardiac output. Anticoagulant drugs, these slow down the, the body's ability to clot. And the one very predominant anticoagulant that's out there um, is Coumadin. And once again, another drug with a very narrow threshold. A little too much Coumadin, you got yourself rat poison. So you gotta be very careful. Antiplatelet drugs, well now we're talking about aspirin. Plavix, and we give aspirin pre-hospitally, and part of our um, treatment for myocardial infarction or suspected angina, and they're very, very effective in preventing further clotting, but they don't do anything for the clot that's already there. So, part of our assessment, getting a history, you'll probably understand why this patient is in cardiovascular compromise, why their blood pressure is dropping. It could be brought on by the medications that they're taking. These medications are getting in the way of hemostasis. 
the hemodynamics are being altered and the body can't compensate for them, so there could be issues. So loss of consciousness is an indicator of poor cerebral perfusion. Skin color and temperature can also be a problem with end-stage end perfusion. If it's not getting to the skin, and that's the largest organ in the body, you could be having problems with other organs as well. So when we do our physical exam, we start by inspecting, auscultate lung fields, palpate the chest, inspect the neck for jugular vein distension, signs of right-sided heart failure. Look for things like surgical scars. Do they have open heart surgery? Is there a nitroglycerin patch? Do they have a, a pacemaker? Do they have left ventricular assist devices? That's big. This is a patient who's on a transplant list for a new heart. Heart sounds, what are you going to listen to? You're going to hear just two sounds, sound one, sound two. Okay, love dub, love dub, love dub. Sound one is love, sound two is dub. And you can see in a cardiac cycle, sound one is the atrial contraction, sound two is the ventricular contraction. If you have anything else, you have a da or a blah, this could be abnormal sounds and usually brought on by valvular regurgitation. So the, the one-way valves are now working and blood is going back up to the atrias or is leaking in the tricuspid semilunar valves. Right, so sound one, corresponding to carotid artery pulses. Decreased sounds indicates that we have a, a mitral valve, obesity, emphysema, cardiac tamponade, or atrial fibrillation. It wouldn't be a sound one. Sound two, corresponding with pulmonary and aortic valves closing, so this is going to be louder of the two. Sound three occurs very commonly in young adults and children. It's a vibration type. Sound four, turbulent filling. That could be a sign of myocardial infarction. Could be a sign of valvular displacement or damage. So doing your physical exam, check for pulses. Is the pulse irregular? Is it very rapid? Is it a weak, thready pulse? Sun drop in cardiac output. Think about doing an EKG fast as one of... If you are in a system and you have another paramedic or you have EMTs, they can get vital signs and you can do a 12 lead. If you're going to put, if you have a cardiac patient, it's a patient you feel is having cardiac or respiratory issue, and you want to monitor them, use a 12 lead first. Unless they're unconscious and you fear a lethal dysrhythmia, get a 12 lead first. There's all different types of pulses you can look for, sure. You got the pulse deficits, you got pulses paradoxus, and you have pulses altern alternans. That's great, but you really like to know the electrical status of the heart as well. Remember, when they're taking vital signs, blood pressure. Hypertension is defined as a systolic BP upwards of 140 and a diastolic around 90. ECG. In the old days, sure, it was three leads. Now, we stress 12 lead. Ask yourself this question. When you bring a patient to the hospital and they're being triaged, what's the first EKG that's, that's performed? It's a 12 lead. You're an ALS provider. Unless you have a patient who's unconscious and you're concerned about a lethal issue, 12 leads. In addition, you have your, your capnography, you have your pulse oximetry, which will test your blood gas levels. What's the torque pressure of oxygen? We can tell by pulse oximeter. What's the torque pressure of, of your carbon dioxide levels in the blood? That's tested by our end tidal CO2, capnography. What a 12 lead's gonna do, and we'll talk about it a little later, is it's gonna give you a three-dimensional view of the heart's electrical activity. And sometimes, especially um, with the elderly patients, they can be hiding from view. So you're looking at lead two with a short of breath patient, you're like, everything's fine as far as the heart's concerned. That's not true. 12 leads, the infarction can be hiding. And it's going to show that, that hidden infarction area that's, that's hiding from your lead two monitor. So cardiac monitoring, we have the standard limb leads, one, two, and three. That's continuous monitoring. But a 12 lead is going to give you a snapshot, three-dimensional picture of the heart. We want to avoid dysrhythmias from occurring. The, the heart muscle is ischemic and 
basically a mutiny has occurred. The cardiac cells are excited on their own. Now if they're denied oxygen, that increases their excitability, which can lead to lethal dysrhythmias. So lead placement. Have your predetermined spots. Limb leads. They are called limb leads because they belong where? On the limbs. Wrists and ankles are fine. That's something important to remember. Continuous monitoring can be done with the abdominal leads, but 12 leads, we want to do the limbs. Remember I talked earlier about Eindhoven's triangle. You look at the right arm is the negative lead. The left leg is the positive lead. So as the heart beats, it's going from negative to positive, and then back up to negative. That's why the QRS is positive to negative. Now these augmented leads, using the limb electrodes, leads AVR, AVL, AVF, this is what's going to start giving you this three-dimensional look. And then it's followed by the chest leads, otherwise known as the precordial leads. V1, V2 should be at the fourth intercostal space right and left sternal borders, not on the sternum itself, but at the edge of the sternum. Then you have uh, V3 is between V2 and V4, anterior wall of left ventricle it's viewing, whereas V1, V2 is viewing the septal wall. Then you have V5 and V6. V6 should be on the mid-axillary line. We have other EKG leads, 15 lead. Now we're, we want to see the right ventricle and posterior wall of the left ventricle, so we go um, V, um, V4, 5, and 6 becomes V4, 7, and 8. It actually inverts, so V4 would go to the right side across, and then the old V6 would be at the right axillary. 18 lead, we go into the rear of the heart, looking for posterior views. So this is the right side of EKGs using that, fi that 15 lead. And you can see V3, V4, V5, V6 are looking at the right ventricle. So a lot of systems have a situation where if you have an inferior wall in mind, meaning you have elevation in 2, 3, and AVL, to confirm that it's a right ventricular involvement, we want to do this 15 lead and a lot of systems and depending on where you go nationally and regionally this will will confirm right side and heart failure and cause you to limit or restrict your nitroglycerin usage because it's going to drop preload and that's not a good thing instead we think of more about fluid to increase preload here's your posterior leads we're talking about with the 18 lead and when are you going to do this? If you see ST elevation in V1 to V6. I'm, not, I'm sorry, not. If you see ST depression in V1 to V6. Depression is a mirror image to, of elevation. So if V1 and V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6 are all ST depression, flip to the back and you'll see them elevate. That's a posterior wall infarction. This is what the leads are doing by, by getting you a three-dimensional view of the heart. Looking at the picture and seeing Wilson's terminal and how it goes down in lead two and how lead one and lead three are out, this also plays a big thing about how the heart functions on an electrical axis. This should be the normal axis, but these are the extremes, 0 and 90. Anything past that, we're shifting to the left, negative, towards negative 90. That's shifting, okay? And that's a sign of a left axis deviation, whereas it's going this way, it's a right axis deviation. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But it has to do with lead polarity. Pole leads have to have that negative and positive. So lead one is, is um, in the left arm is the positive terminal. The right arm is negative. So we're going from negative to positive. And this 
describes exactly how this baseline and waveform takes place. What we're actually looking at. Very important to understand graph paper. It's designed to measure horizontally, it's measuring time. Vertically, it's measuring um, amplitude. One millimeter box, vertical box, going horizontally is 0 0.04 seconds. So then one big box is comprised of five little boxes, it's 0 0.20 seconds. That's very important to remember. Graph paper moves the styles at 25 millimeters per second. That's how you get that exact measurement. So once again, one little box is 0 0.04 seconds. And one big box, which is five little boxes, is 0 0.20 seconds. And you can see how the EKG rhythm is going to correspond directly with electrical events in the heart. And only electrical events. So that P wave, your atrial depolarization, the Peter interval, the period of time it's going from the AV node down to the bundle branches and start of the ventricular contraction cycle. Normal duration should be 0.12 to 0.20, but when we mentioned earlier there are there are nerve endings that go around the AV node that in the, in the overstimulation, tachycardic arena, the Peter interval will then be lower, it will be much narrower. QRS complex, depolarization of the two contracting ventricles going down the bundle branches with a positive deflection and going up the Purkinje fibers with a negative deflection. The J point is the start of the ST segment. The J point is important in determining ST elevation, ST depression, and left or right bundle branch blocks. Here's your T wave. This is representing ventricular repolarization. The beginning, the first half of it is known as the absolute refractory period, and the second half is the relative refractory period as it starts going down. So the QT interval is the electrical activity of one completed ventricular cycle. It's the, it's the actual cycle of sending it down the bundle branches and up the Purkinje fibers. So our method to interpret dysrhythmias, once again, identify the waves, do they exist? Is there a P wave, is there a QRS, and is there a tape? Measure the P to R interval, measure the QRS. Is the rhythm regular? and then measure the wave itself. So looking at rhythm regularity, looking at the R to R interval, are they the same? Is it consistent? The distance between the R waves, are they irregular? Yes. Well, what is the, is the irregularity a pattern that's known as regularly irregular? Or is it irregularly irregular, meaning there is no pattern? We can also use the six second method for determining heart rate. Count the number of QRS complexes in a six second strip and multiply it by 10. A more um, correct and precise method is using the sequence. Find the R wave and count the, the big boxes after. So it, how long does it take for R to R interval? Is it, one box, then the heart rate's 300. Is it two boxes, the heart rate's 150. Is it three boxes, the heart rate's 100. Is it four boxes, it's 75. Is it five boxes, it's 60. Well, this is not five boxes, but the next R interval takes place about two in, so the heart rate is about 66. Then we determine our cardiac dysrhythmias. Now dysrhythmias, certain specific dysrhythmias, can have, they can be lethal, they can be normal. Sinus tachycardia is more of a compensatory issue. It's brought on by things like hypoxia, metabolic al alkalosis, we have with diabetic ketoacidosis, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia. And what we do is we create what's known as a circus reentry. 
and through compensatory mechanisms and, and um, sympathetic response, we have that depolarization and then it just re-enters back in and quickly depolarizes, re-enters right back in. So sometimes it doesn't even have the SA node involved. Six sinus syndrome, this is a poorly functioning sinoatrial node. We can tell on EKG a lot of times it, the P wave looks different. We can have sinus arrest, it's an irregular um, atrial rate where the sinus is not working on a pacemaker style. Atrial flutter, the atria is contracting way too fast and the ventricles can't match. So what happens with this, They're, they have that classic sawtooth pattern and the result is known as an F wave. So through another process of circus rancher, we're getting constant atrial contraction, atrial contraction, atrial contraction, followed by a ventricular response. That's a conduction rate. And this one, this is a three to one AV conduction rate. So the atrium is contracting three times before a ventricular contraction. This is a sign of a serious heart problem. It can lead to rapid atrial fibrillation and sudden cardiac arrest. So only really the, the goal for this is really uh, cardioversion or medicinal issues. We give uh, calcium channel blockers for this, like or verapamil. Only really cardiovert this patient in the field if their ventricular response is, is at a two to one conduction where we're talking about over 150 beats per minute. Atrial fibrillation, it could be a new onset, it could be a chronic issue. The atrias are, are not actually contracting, they're more fibrillating. It's a, it's a SA nodal uh, disease. Superventricular tachycardia is a generic term. It means that the ventricles, the, the, the stimulus is occurring above the ventricles. So it's not ventricular in origin. It's above the ventricles. And we know this because it's a nice tight complex. It's not wide and bizarre. But since we can't see a P wave, we don't know what the underlying, re, what the underlying rhythm really is. So we give it a general generic SVT. Premature atrial complexes, uh, once again, this could be part of a sick sinus syndrome. The SA node fired early, and you can see right there, there's that irregular beat that's premature. It's not an escape. If it was an escape, it would be further down. So this is an example of premature rhythm, and this would be an example of an escape rhythm if it takes too long. Wandering atrial pacemakers, very similar to a sick sinus syndrome, or we're going to have different looking P waves. Now, if the SA node fails, our first fail safe, the next pacemaker takes over. It's the AV node. Now, remember the AV node has an intrinsic rate lower than the SA node. So, any rhythms originating in the AV node normally will be bradycardic in nature. So you can tell that you have an AV nodal um, rhythm by different things. If, the, if, if it's a high nodal junctional rhythm, it's going to have an inverted P wave. Why? Because the signal is being sent up the internal pathways and you're going to have atrial involvement, but it's reversed. It's going from negative to positive instead of from positive to negative. If it's lower down the AV node, you're not going to have any P wave and therefore no atrial contraction. So this is an example of a junctional rhythm and it's a junctional escape rhythm because it's operating at the intrinsic rate. If it's a junctional tachycardia it could possibly be overwhelming the SA node. But this is an escape rhythm, meaning it waited for the SA node to fire, didn't receive a signal so it took over. Premature junctional complexes, well this is something that overwhelmed and fired before it should have. And it's premature. If you look, it's, it's, it's happening before an SA node is being allowed to fire. This could be a chronic thing. Rarely do we treat it in the pre-hospital setting. We have to look at overall issues. Now, heart blocks. This is where the SA node is 
is be, is firing okay, but there's a problem with the communication between it and the AV node. First degree heart blocks, this is a, a much longer than normal delay in holding that signal line for full atrial kick in the AV node. So this is very common. It's, it's something that uh, preoperatively doesn't have to be treated. You just know that it's larger than 0 0.20 seconds in length. Secondary block, now we have a winky block. It occurs with the blockage of that wink, uh, winky block fiber. It's going to cause a delay in conduction. It's going to delay, 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 and then drop a beat. Once again, we treat underlying issues, but this is not a rhythm that we would treat unless it's bradycardic. Second degree block, Mobitz type 2, this is your classical block. So what's happening is the P waves are firing, but not every one is making it to the AV node and being interpreted. So we have atrial kick, hopefully. We have definitely have atrial depolarization. And um, every once in a while we'll get ventricular depolarization and hopefully ventricular systole only really treated with bradycardia, but just understand that second degree heart blocks with someone with chest pain in the MI setting can morph into a complete heart block or a third degree heart block. And this is where the um, communication has been completely cut off. So the SA node, they have no idea. They're firing and the atriums are contracting. So the ventricles are waiting for a signal that's not coming. So they're gonna go into their fail safe. So you can tell what type of escape rhythm you've got. This picture here, this slide, will show that there is junctional escape. Why? Because it's above the ventricles, it's at the AV junction, it's at the normal pacemaker, the escape pacemaker rhythm. So this rhythm is 40, it is a bradycardia, but it's a narrow complex. If the complex was wide and bizarre and slower, usually in the 20 to 30 range, then that's ventricular escape from the Purkinje fibers. And that's a sign of a very seriously damaged heart because the SA and the AV node are both not firing. it can morph into what's known as an idioventricular rhythm. Now, what does that stand for, idioventricular? It's somewhere in the ventricles, I don't know. Idiot, I don't know. I don't know, it's somewhere in the ventricles, but I know it's there because it's wide and bizarre. Most of the time, we don't have a pulse associated with this, or if the pulse is there, the blood pressure is so low, so we're gonna have to aggressively manage patients with this type of dysrhythmia. This is a potentially lethal dysrhythmia as is a tachycardia. Any, any um, ventricular originating dominant rhythms, like idioventricular or ventricular tachycardia, is, um, has the ability to become a lethal dysrhythmia, simply because it's not natural and can stop at any time. The ventricles are not tasked with being the pacemaker. So the Purkinje fires are firing, but they don't, they're not obligated to fire. They can stop at any time. we can morph into ventricular, tachycard of, of ventricular fibrillation. Now this is a form of, of VTAC, it's known as torsade de point, known as turning of the points. Usually torsade de point is brought on by hypomagnesemia, which is why mag sulfate is indicated for its use, but um, the problem with torsades is the, the issue is it's, it's refractory to fibrillation, so we want to get them out of torsades. You look at a premature ventricular complex, this is a sign of an irritable heart firing on its own, not waiting for a signal to be sent. And it's premature because you can see that pause, it's happening before the SA node should be firing. So it's premature. It's not an escape rhythm. Now these ventricular contractions can be coming from one point or multiple points, unifocal 
usually it's a it's a isolated area of, of damage and irritation, whereas multifocals coming from all areas, multiple areas of, of the ventricles, which could be a sign of acute coronary syndrome and systemic hypoxia. We have different types of premature ventricular complex, uh, complexes. We have couplets and salvos. Three or more in a row, a salvo is known as a run of ventricular tachycardia and treated as such. Bigeminy is one every other, and then trigeminy is every third. V-fib, we have electrical activity, no mechanical function. They're all depolarizing on their own. The heart is in mutiny. Asystole, there's actually no electrical or mechanical function. Sometimes when the internal pathways break down, the SA node, the AV node are not functioning, there has to be an artificial pacemaker put in. And the way you can tell you have an artificial pacemaker, of course, is that spike. That's the artificial stimulus. And then you have a ventricular response. That's usually wide and bizarre. It's not following the correct internodal pathways, so we end up with a different type of rhythm. And once again, patients with pacemakers, you can't tell ST elevation signs of an MI on it because the, the heart is functioning electrically different, so you can't take from that. People with chest pain with pacemakers, they rule out MIs based on blood work. Newer pacemakers, we have the AV sequentials, if the pacemaker is failing, the spikes will be visible but not followed by QRS. That's known as loss of capture. These patients, severe emergency because they have an underlying cardiac condition that caused a cardiologist to insert a pacemaker, and now that pacemaker is failing, which means that they're in cardiovascular compromise. So we have to continue that treatment, but we give it through transdermal pacing. So once again, new science, 12 leads. 12 leads should be an integral part of your overall assessment for patients in respiratory or cardiovascular issues. We use our six limb leads followed by, I'm sorry, we use our four limb leads followed by our six chest leads. These are your precordial leads, 12 lead components. And what you're looking for is 12, a, a snapshot of 12 locations in the heart. Lead 2, 3, and AVF, this is your inferior aspect, okay, from the right coronary artery. V1, V2 is ventricular, I'm sorry, septal. V3, V4 is anterior, V5, V6. One AVL is lateral. V5, V6 alone is indicative of a low lateral, but if 5, 6, 1 in AVL, it's a high lateral. And if you look at this, you can actually know exactly not only the presence of an infarction and in tissue damage, injury, or death, but also where it's located exactly. I'm going to show you guys something. So AVR is out of the picture because it's the semilunar valve. Okay, this is the map. Semilunar valve and there's no myocardial tissue to be concerned about. Coming off of that is the aorta. Off of the aorta, we have the right coronary artery that goes down the inferior aspect of the heart. Okay? Off of this comes the left coronary artery that branches down to the septal continues across the circumflex where it goes into the LAD, and the circumflex continues around the back of the heart and comes up through the right atrium. Let me do that one more time. This is the semilunar valve, the aortic valve. It's out of the picture. Coming off of it is the aorta. Right coronary artery goes down the inferior aspect of the heart perfuses these three areas. Left coronary artery starts up here, goes down the left anterior descending, branches into the septal, and then becomes the circumflex going around. 
So you see the left side, this is known as the Widowmaker. It encompasses about 75% of the myocardium, responsible for perfusion of 75% of the myocardial space. So remember, you want to do an I see all leads. Train your eyes to look at a 12 lead properly. It's not, it's not like a magic picture where you let your eyes go numb, you know, go lose focus, and you see a sailboat pop up. You got to know what to look for. So use this guideline. It's called ICO leads. Start with the most common area of infarction that you're going to find. The inferior leads, 2, 3 AVF, followed by the septal, V1, V2. Then look at your anterior leads, V3, V4, and finally finish up with your lateral, V5, V6, and then come back for 1 and AVL. Now what are you looking for? Focus on the ST segment. ST elevation, that's what we're looking for. That's the most important thing. And they have to be in contiguous leads, meaning for it to be in, considered an inferior wall MI, it's got to be in 2, 3 AVF. For it to be considered a septal wall MI, it's got to be in both V1 and V2. And that's the important thing. Now, the heart I mentioned earlier sits on an electrical axis. It's going from negative to positive. Axis is defined as the general direction that the impulse can travel down the heart. Normal impulses go from right to left and from negative to positive and then back up, up the Purkinje fibers, from um, positive to negative. The normal range in between that is between 0 and 90 degrees. If you deviate, either go negative 20, negative 30, or 95, 110, 120, that's known as a hemi-block. You've got to go in one direction. A blockage of, the, of one of those fascicles coming off of the bundle of hitch going down the right and left bundle branches, a blockage of one of those fascicles will delay conduction across and cause an electrical shift. So here's your axis, viewed from lead one. The QRS should be positive, heading towards the left arm, and negative, heading towards the right arm. So right axis deviation, you're going to see ranges of 90 to 180 degrees. Downward QRS in lead one, very common in children, tall, thin adults. They have a history of COPD, could be the sign of pulmonary hypertension. If it's over 180 degrees, wide complex, that's VTAC. Left axis deviation, we're moving on the left side, 0 to negative 40 degrees. That period between 0 and negative 40 is known as a physiologic left axis deviation. One fascicle is blocked, the other one is usually working. Axis range of negative 40 to negative 90 degrees, remember there are there's three fascicles coming off the bundle of hiss. One goes down the right bundle branch, and two are on the left side. One of the two goes down the left bundle branch and the other goes out into the left ventricle. The reason why the left side has two fascicles for conduction is because the left side is much larger than the right side for obvious reasons. So if you have that electrical shift and you've got one fascicle blocked, the other one's working on the left side. So that's a physiologic left axis deviation, but if you end up shifting way across, that means both fascicles are blocked, that's a pathologic left axis deviation, otherwise known as an anterior hemi block or a bifascicular block. You can also see a patient develop what's known as a left bundle branch block. Why is it a left bundle branch block? Because the bundle branch on the left side is blocked. Since you lost two of your three fascicles, you have a high risk of losing all three if the patient is having chest pain, and this is an MI situation, and that three fascicular block is known as a complete heart block or a third degree block. So look at this with the QRS using leads one and leads AVF. If lead one and AVF are upright, normal axis. Lead one is up, but AVF is down, left axis deviation. Lead one is down, 
but AVF is up, right axis deviation. And if both leads are down, you're thinking about extreme right axis deviation and ventricular tachycardia. And that's an important thing to remember. The axis will always move towards the hypertrophy and away from the infarction. An enlarged ventricle is going to need more electrical energy, but an infarcted ventricle doesn't have any electrical energy. It's dead tissue. So bundle branch blocks, to know that they exist, is a widened QRS complex preceded by a P wave. That's how you know it's supraventricular in origin, because you had the P wave. So it's a, Q, a widened QRS preceded by a P wave, because if you look at ventricular contractions, like idioventricular or VTAC, there are no P waves. So you need to have a P wave with a widened QRS, and you got yourself a bundle branch block. A right bundle branch block, in V1, you have that R, S, R prime. Whereas a left bundle branch block, you end up with that downward deflection. How can you recognize? Well, remember we talked about that J point earlier? It's the start of the ST segment. Well, I want you to refer back to it now. I want you to find that J point and look for terminal force. Terminal force is which way are we going? Are we going from before the J point? Is it deflecting up or down? You only see this in V1. Why? Because V1 is looking directly at the septal wall. So, looking at this, is this going up or down? It's going down. This from the J point, is it going up or down? It's going up. The theory that we have is known as the turn signal theory. When you go and make a turn, the directional arrow, to make a right turn, it goes up. To make a left turn, you go down. So if you have a downward deflection, it's a left bundle branch block. Whereas if you have a right bundle branch block, it's an upward deflection. So let's practice this. Start first with the, with the EKG on the left. Look for the J point. Is it going down or up? The terminal force is going down, so it's a left bundle branch block. Now look at the one on the right. Look for your J point, the start of the ST segment. The terminal force, is it going up or down? It's going up, therefore it's a right bundle branch block. The same is true here, the J point starts, we're going up right bundle branch block. And now on the right side we see the, the J point, the terminal force is going down. We have a left bundle branch block. Now these fascicular blocks, blocks of those fascicles coming off the bundle of hiss and the start of the bundle branches, are known as hemi blocks. Anterior fascicular blocks, we're going to have issues with leads 2, 3, and AVF, the, the uh, inferior wall of the heart, okay? And posterior fascicular blocks, we're going to have issues, we're going to have um, issues with lead 1. A bifascicular block, two or more fascicles are blocked, whereas a trifascicular, you got a third degree heart block. Now earlier we discussed how we have some um, we have some fibers that don't go, electrical fibers that don't make it to the AV node. They go past the AV node, and they're activated in, in tachycardias. Well, some of these accessory pathways are always working, not just in tachycardias. And these are known as pre-excitation. They cause early depolarization of ventricular tissue without waiting for the AV node to fire. So, Patients with Wolf, Parkinson, White, or Lown, Ganglion, Levine syndrome end up with this type of pre-excitation. And we get something known as a delta wave. So normal tracing is, is there with the, if the delta wave wasn't present, but you see how we have that gradual shift? That's a sign of Wolf, Parkinson, White. There's no real defined Q wave. It just slopes. That's pre-excitation of the ventricles. 
And that could be a problem because you can end up with runs of SVT. Patients with Wolf Parkinson White will complain of that. The simple fact that it doesn't have to wait for the AV node to fire, so it's just going to fire on its own. So in cardiac compromise, acute coronary syndrome management, time is muscle. We want to minimize time to treatment. In, the, in, car, in STEMI centers, they want door to needle times, but now they're talking about a f onset to needle time, getting them to a cath lab in the presence of STMI. So we have EMS to balloon time, door to balloon time, door to needle time. Rapid identification is the consistent part of this as far as we're concerned. So just realize that it's a gradual state. Remember that original, you know, the heart, cardiac cells can, they need to have oxygen to survive. So they can go through aerobic metabolism and they can produce ATP in conjunction with sugar. And when they're denied oxygen, they're still metabolizing. They're still creating energy, but through anaerobic metabolism. And they're kicking off lactic acid. And that's when you start feeling that pain, that burning sensation in your chest. It's a buildup of lactic acid by the cells that are still alive but operating on emergency power. They start to get irritated. And you can see it starts with that ST depression. This is where we have ischemia, that T wave inversion, that's classic ischemic chest pain. The tissue is alive but in critical condition, operating off of anaerobic metabolism. This will suddenly start to morph and you can see how the ST segment begins to get more positively charged. It's moving up, up, up and it increases. All right, remember I talked about repolarization being an active process, pumping out that sodium, getting back in the potassium to the sodium-potassium pump, working against diffusion. Part, that part of repolarization expends the most energy. And we're going from a positive charge down to a negative charge, a resting polarity. So that ST segment, if you don't have enough ATP, you can't get rid of that excess sodium and you stay more positively charged and your ST segment elevates as the tissues, as the cells start to die. Then we have a shift with infarction where we see that Q wave present. ST elevation with that T wave inversion and now we have scar tissue. We've got to get this patient between ischemia and injury don't want the infarction to take place. Infarction means tissue death. So T wave is the most dynamic wave. So this is what we're looking for because this is the period where the heart is, is uh, utilizing its most energy reserves to try and get back to a resting state. Our treatment is, in addition to early recognition, 12 leads, is to basically address the blockage, the coronary artery issues. Aspirin, nitroglycerin. STEMI treatment involves in-hospital reperfusion, either medicinally with TPA, streptokinase, or surgically by insertion of a balloon. Having the ability to put a 12 lead on and know how to read it properly allows you to tell if you're going to the right facility. Is this a STEMI candidate or a non-STEMI chest pain? So let's practice. Let's look at this EKG and incorporate ICO leads. So first thing you want to look at is the inferior. Look at leads 2, 3, and AVF. And I want you just to focus on the ST segment. Do you see any ST elevation? No. Now let's go to the septal, V1 and V2. Do you see ST elevation? Yes. Is it in the contiguous leads of V1 and V2? Yes. Okay. Now let's go to V3 and V4, the anterior leads. 
Do you see elevation? Yes. Now let's go to V5 and V6. This is the low lateral. Do we see elevation? It's up for debate, right? Definitely in V5, but I'm not sure in V6. So guess what? It's not in continuous leads. I'm going to say no. Now we'll go to the high lateral, 1 in AVL. Do you see any ST elevation? It's not pronounced. It's not 1 millimeter. So I'm going to say no. So what am I left with? This is an anterior septal MI. Now, if you had just put the patient on a three-lead monitor who was short of breath, you would never know that they were having an MI. You would never know that they were a candidate for a STEMI center. So it is of the utmost importance to remember to put your patient on a 12-lead as soon as possible. Let's look at this one. Once again, look at the inferior aspect, leads 2, 3, AVF. Do you see elevation? Yes. V1, V2, do you see elevation? No, but there's some T-wave inversion, correct? Yes. V3, V4, the anterior, do we see elevation? No. V5, V6, do we see elevation? No. 1 and AVL, in the high, in the, in the high lateral, you see some T-wave inversion, but it's not contiguous, so no. So what am I looking at here? I'm looking at an inferior wall MI. Now, if this didn't exist, and I only saw V1 and V2 with that inverted T, then you can call that a septal wall ischemia. It's not a patient that goes to a STEMI center. But since we have ST elevation in 2, 3, and AVF, that is a STEMI criteria. Now, some systems would look at this and say, it's an inferior wall. We'd want to do a 15 lead to make sure that the right ventricle is not completely ischemic. And then, and then because of that, we would give fluids and restrict nitrates. Looking at this one, 2, 3, and AVF, it's kind of wide and bizarre, right? See, here's the problem you're looking at. You have a wide, bizarre rhythm preceded by a P wave. This is a bundle branch block, and bundle branch blocks are going to get in the way of your proper interpretation. Now, there are things that can cause EKG abnormalities that are not ischemia or infarction, like a pulmonary embolus. Pulmonary embolus is going to have an effect on the right side of the heart. That, that thrombus, that blockage, is going to cause um, increased pulmonary pressure. And what you're going to see is possible new right bundle branch block. And we always look for these blocks in V1. So let's take a look at that. You look at V1, look for that. Is it a bundle branch block? It's a wide QRS preceded by a P wave. Look for our start of the ST segment. Here it is. That's a J point. Is it going up or down? It's going up. So terminal force is right. It's a right bundle branch block. Other issues like um, severe hypothermia can develop an Osborne or J wave. Patients can also become bradycardic associated with this wave. Electrolyte imbalances, we have those peak T waves, sign of hyperkalemia. And with hypokalemia, we can have a very flat T or a U wave. There's a, one of the top causes of sudden cardiac arrest is a, a dysfunction known as a long QT syndrome. This is a genetic predisposition. 
and sometimes it can be caused by administration of certain drugs like digitalis, um, and it can lead to issues like sudden cardiac arrest. Now, when we're talking about tachycardias, we want to decide whether the patient is stable or unstable. Unstable tachycardia presents patients with chest pain, shortness of breath, low blood pressure, and change in mental status. If they are unstable, they get Edison. If they're stable, they get medicine. Rates of 150 or more with serious signs of tachycardia of serious signs and symptoms is unstable tachycardia. Our issue with correcting this can be fatal since we're stopping the heart from working through a cardioversion, but sometimes the reward is worth the risk. If the signs and symptoms are milder and they're stable, then we want to think about medicine instead. One management of tachycardia is with uh, vagus nerve stimulation, carotid sinus massage. But in order to do this, got to make sure the patient doesn't have bruies, don't have a history of CVA, atherosclerosis. This can be a dangerous thing because you could move a clot and cause a stroke. Another safer way to do it is have the patient bear down. They never want you to massage both carotid arteries simultaneously. You're going to do carotid sinus massage, one artery only. Another management is to give adenosine, six milligrams, followed by a 20 cc flush. It's very safe. It's got about a 30 second half life. And at six milligrams, it really doesn't work effectively. But what it does do is give you an underlying rhythm because you're SVT, so you're in a rapid rhythm that's narrow and complex in nature. That's how you know it's supraventricular. But is it rapid atrial fib? Is it a flutter? Is it atrial tachycardia? You don't know because it's too fast. So you give the adenosine six milligrams, and what that does is it's going to slow down the rhythm for about 10 seconds, and then it'll speed back up. But what those 10 seconds are going to show you is the underlying rhythm. So, if you give the adenosine and you're running a strip, very important to run that strip, slow down the heart, put it into that brief period of asystole, everybody takes a collective gasp, and then they suddenly come back, and it's atrial fib at 80, and then it goes back into SVT. It's not SVT anymore. What is it? It's rapid atrial fib. Now you can get on the phone with telemetry, tell them your findings, and get authorization for a drug like Cardizem. Remember, with CPR, it's, it's, your, it's important that you know the fundamentals of the new changes with CPR. So it's 30 compressions followed by two breaths, a rate of at least 100 times a minute. Only time you're going to interrupt compressions now for advanced airway placement, defibrillation, or if you have to move the patient. And you don't want to, you don't want to cease for more than 10 seconds. You're going to lose the pressure that you built up with the compressions. With advanced cardiac life support, always remember your CPR. But we want to minimize chest, chest compression. So airway management is paramount, but it doesn't always have to be intubation, depending on what system you work. You might use alternate airways first. You might use um, a dual lumen device or, or a uh, king tube just to get good airway so you can start ventilating and reduce gastric distension. It's up to you. Cardiac monitoring or dysrhythmia recognition is key in early onset of advanced cardiac life support. Remember your universal algorithm. As you approach the scene, you want to bring in all of your ALS equipment. When you find a patient unconscious and you suspect they're in cardiac arrest, we do our CAB, circulation airway breathing. If no pulse, start CPR. If you have the defibrillator there at the time, immediately open the defibrillator and place it. Defibrillate if the AD um, 
states it, or if you find the patient to be in V-fib on your manual defibrillator. Once you're done defibrillating, immediately do, to, immediately do CPR, immediately. What you're doing is you're priming the pump. You're causing systolic and diastolic pressures to be restored to allow for good brain perfusion and coronary artery perfusion, since we know that coronary arteries receive their blood supply during diastole, good chest compressions give you systolic pressure, and then the release gives you good diastolic pressure. So that's your universal algorithm. Patients in V-fib or pulses VTAC, CPR, you're doing the defibrillation, think about the shock drug shock regimen. You have your standing order medications. Of course, epinephrine raises your fibrillation threshold, allows for um, a better chance of conversion. So we have vasopressin, we have epinephrine, we have lidocaine, we have amiodarone, we have magnesium sulfate. All these drugs are at your disposal. And of course, you need to refer to your local regional protocols for what levels you're going to be administering these medications, what priorities are given. And this is the VFib Pulseless VTAC resuscitation protocol. I'm going to go to the next slide. If you want to pause it to review, you can take the opportunity now. Now, pulseless electrical activity is not something that you can see on a monitor. It's something that the patient presents in. You're not getting any mechanical function that is at least palpable by a carotid artery check. So what's on the monitor is one thing. What you're seeing electrically or mechanically is another. So patients in PEA will present in anything, sinus tachycardia, sinus bradycardia, all different, but their underlying rhythm is the sinus bradycardia, sinus tachycardia, what's seen on the monitor electrically. Their condition is PEA. So if you ever find yourself making a diagnosis, you have to say this patient is in a sinus rhythm, but they're in PEA. They're showing your sinus rhythm on the monitor, and they're in PEA. This has a lot to do with finding out what the underlying causes could be. Use your five H's and five T's. Asystole is asystole, and even the new AHA guidelines are saying, give it a shot for a few minutes and you want to consider stopping CPR. It's very rare to bring someone back from asystole. If they don't have that initial response, then more than likely you're not going to get them back. New science we have with post-resuscitative care involves preserving brain tissue. And the way we do that is to assure better circulation, correct any post-resuscitative hypotension. We can do that with vasopressors. But also we want to slow down the metabolism. Now that sounds funny because they were dead already, so what metabolism do we need to slow down? The fact of the matter is the cells are still working but they're working off of anaerobic metabolism and they're creating lactic acid. So this is a problem. Also, the brain is very sensitive to changes, so we need to slow down its metabolism. And the best way to do that is through hypothermia. Hypothermic treatment allows for a slower me metabolic state and a more gradual response back. It preserves cells. It doesn't freeze them. It slows down their need to work and their demand on oxygen consumption. Now, with the new national standard curriculum, CPR can be terminated without notifying a physician, but it's still regulated by local regional protocols. So once again, know which protocols you can follow. 
issues like DNRs, most forms that aren't readily available to you, but are told that they're, in, they're around, start CPR until they're presented to you and you can physically see that they exist and they're valid. At that point, you can stop CPR. And depending on what region you're in, you can either stop yourself or through medical control consult. So coronary artery disease, most common form of heart disease in the United States. If they're blocked, oxygen is not going to be able to deliver to the cells, the cells will die. Atherosclerosis affects the inner lining of the aorta. It leads to narrowing of the vasculature and reduction of blood flow. Risk factors for atherosclerosis include um, chronic hypertension, cigarette smoking, men get it more than women, diabetes, um, a lot of different things. Angina pectoris is a, is a situation where the oxygen supplying to, to the heart does not meet the oxygen consumption demands of the heart. It's usually brought on in an exercise or active state. Rest and um, nitrates usually resolves this because it's not a blockage. Prinz metals angina is a coronary artery spasm and can a sudden onset of chest pain. Different things can bring on Prinz metals angina. One common thing that can bring on is cocaine overdose. People with stable angina usually treat it themselves rest, nitrates, they're feeling fine. Unstable, no change with nitrates and rest. That could be a warning of, of an impending myocardial infarction. There could be blockage. So any group of clinical symptoms consistent with an MI should go to a STEMI center. 12 lead with ST segment elevation or a Q wave, that's an, that's an acute myocardial infarction. STEMI criteria. No ST segment, unstable angina, not a STEMI center criteria, but definitely a hospital with cardiology. ST segment depression with no changes, it's angina. So make sure you do a thorough exam, get your vital signs, do a 12 lead, talk to the patient, get a history, find out everything that's going on. The most common symptom is chest pain, but not everybody gets it. Especially elderly, diabetics, people with neuropathies won't have that pronounced chest pain, that visceral pain. Instead, they can have issues like sudden shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, loss of consciousness, syncopal episode. Women present with nausea, lightheadedness, epigastric or back pain, and in some cases even toothache. So when we're assessing our patients, get a full history. Realize that these patients could have some underlying issues that are going to get in the way of their visceral response to pain. Remember, visceral is internal pain. It's a different pathway than your somatic, which is your muscle muscles and your musculoskeletal system. Put the patient in a comfortable position. You know, this is when you bring the stretcher in, have them relax. Treat, of course, with that Mona, the oxygen, aspirin, nitro, and if needed, morphine. Make sure we don't mix nitrates with those PDE5 inhibitors like Viagra or Cialis. Always check blood pressure before and after nitro administration. Find out histories of cardiac disease, any heart medications around if they had a heart attack in the past, and family, social history. Did their parents suffer from chest pain and have a heart attack? Find out their social history, recreational drug use, smoking, things like that. Most MIs are going to occur from a thrombus formation. This is going to dam up the works, prevent further blood flow. The best way to handle it is reperfusion. There's different types of reperfusion. We have fibrinolytics, which break the clots, kind of like the liquid plumber of the cardiovascular system. But there, if systems that use that have checklists that have to be followed, 
chronic bleeding, uh, GI issues, a lot of different things have to be um, assured that haven't, aren't in place before you give something that's going to not, that's going to burst all clots in the cardiovascular system. It can lead to major internal bleeding. Something a little bit safer and more direct is our percutaneous coronary intervention or PCI. And for STEMI patients, it's an acute issue. For patients with unstable angina or non-STM, ST elevation MI, this could be an elective, scheduled type of procedure. We know congestive heart failure is when the heart can't pump correctly and we have a backflow of pressure. Backflow of pressure going up the left atria, goes into the left cap, the, the capillaries around the alveoli, hydrostatic pressure forces fluid in. Different things can cause it, but primarily when you have that buildup of pressure in the lungs, fluid in the lungs, that's left side of heart failure. Signs and symptoms in addition to the, the rails, you're going to have restlessness, dyspnea, sometimes pink frothy sputum, and an adrenergic response, tachycardia. So what are we going to do? We're going to give oxygen, decrease the workload by reducing preload. Check the blood pressure. You know, if, if, if we're talking about uh, low blood pressure, then we have to address it with fluids or vasopressors. If it's elevated blood pressure, then we have to address it by reducing preload. These patients usually wind up having to get new hearts, and they're waiting on a transplant list. Now, to extend their time on a transplant list and keep them alive longer, we have something called left ventricular assist devices, or LVADs. They can actually assist. And people with LVADs, what's interesting about this, it sucks blood out, and patients don't really have a pulse anymore. They don't get a blood pressure with them. They're awake and talking to you. Now, as the left side of the heart fails and backs blood up, it's going to cause pressure increase on the right side, the pulmonary artery. And that can lead to right side heart failure. So the number one cause of right side heart failure is left side heart failure. And you're going to see peripheral um, response of hydrostatic pressure changes. So decreasing your preload can improve your left side heart failure issues. Unless you've lost the ability to maintain a good cardiac output and blood pressure, in which case you're going to have to increase systemic vascular resistance to restore normal blood pressure so you can perfuse your organs. Cardiac tamponade, this occurs, of course, when there's excessive fluid around the pericardial sac. If left untreated, it can squeeze down the heart and cause um, obstructive shock. What can bring it on? A lot of different things. Tumors, pericarditis, chest trauma. Patients present weak and, and uh, short of breath. Their stroke volume is decreased, their blood pressure is precipitously dropping, and they get uh, distended jugular veins. You review your BEX triad. So our management for that, well, they ultimately need pericardial centesis that's outside of our scope of practice, but it's done in the hospital. Cardiogenic shock, this is left side heart failure with, with a drop in cardiac output, signs and symptoms of shock. The BP is going to fall less than 90. So, of course, the issue with this is not a preload concern, but problems with perfusion. So, we have to increase our afterload. We have to increase systemic vascular resistance and therefore re increase our pressures going into the capillary beds. And we do that with vasopressors like dopamine and dobutamine. We also start off, of course, with oxygen. 12 lead EKG, monitor blood pressure. In addition to dopamine, we can give norepinephrine or even epidrips. I mean, it's up to your protocol, your region, your agency. If you're doing um, transports, and you're transporting somebody in cardiogenic shock, you may end up with these uh, left ventricular assist devices that are temporary known as balloon pumps. Aortic aneurysm is a dilating or pouching of a blood vessel. Third spacing, extra blood. We have a tearing of the inner lining 
of one of the great vessels and blood is is actually false creating a false lumen it's tunneling in between um, in between one of the layers of the heart of the vessels this comes from usually um, excessive hy chronic hypertension also from chronic conditions like Marfan syndrome where connective tissue is not rigid it, it's very porous it becomes more susceptible So what's happening is this false loom is being created. You're going to have blood third spacing, basically, and we're going to see a, a precipitous drop in blood pressure. We want to avoid the, the rupture. It starts first with the dissection, that tearing away, that false lumen. So coronary blood flow is going to be affected if it involves a, the aortic valve. So this can lead to an MI. But most of the time, it's past that, so we're getting blood returning to the heart, but we have a sudden drop in blood pressure. When we classify where the tears are occurring, where the entry point is, by Stanford type A or type B. Stanford type A is at the ascending aorta. This patient requires surgery, where type B can actually be handled medically by lowering blood pressure, giving like beta blockers and things like that. So our assessment of patients who have a dissecting aneurysm, they have chronic hypertension, they could be pregnant, um, and like I mentioned about the Marfan syndrome. So the, the chief complaint they're going to have is sudden chest pain that was maximal at onset and then is slowly reduced. That's a clinical sign. Big red flag. Incredible chest pain, almost tearing in nature, and now it's starting to get a little bit better. All right? As the dissection proceeds distally, the pain is going to start going away. Why? Because the pressure is being relieved by the creation of that false lumen. Our management is to, to calm the patient, give oxygen, recognize that there could be possibly a problem, because when you give a presentation to the ER, you, are, you should be giving your concerns of a possibly aortic dissection. Because remember, as it's getting further and further down, the dissection's occurring, the patient's clinical signs and symptoms are gonna to start to get less and less. And this is where it becomes nefarious, where it gets hidden, and some patients are misdiagnosed. If you have an issue with a ruptured aneurysm, this is a patient who's bleeding out through a great vessel. In a couple of minutes, they'll be dead. We never want to have this happen. If we find ourselves doing it, this where some systems will require you to put on uh, mass trousers and treat it like an internal bleed. Hypertensive emergencies, high BP affects 60 million Americans right now in this country. And this is where the BP at rest is greater than 140 over 90. What's happening is you're putting excess stress on the cardiovascular system because the resting pressures are too high. It's always under, it's under too much pressure. And we're going to have issues that can exist with this. Hypertensive emergencies, you're going to have some neurologic deficits. And our management really is to deal with um, a slow drop. Find out cause and effect. All right, we want to see what's bringing this on. So what we look at is that increase in mean arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure, the equation is diastolic blood pressure plus one-third of the systolic minus the diastolic. Okay, so that's going to give you a mean arterial pressure, and a high mean arterial pressure is going to put too much uh, pressure on the semilunar valve of the heart that can cause it to implode. We want to lower a BP by gradual methods. So this is more of an in-hospital treatment. We want to start everything by oxygen. Oxygen is a nice vasodilator. It will start working. Some systems allow for nitrates to be administered. Some systems want to treat it a little more aggressively uh, with beta blockers. Usually you find these in your, your uh, suburban or rural systems where you have extended transport times. So you're going to start the process. But you want to slowly, gradually drop it because you don't want that watershed stroke to occur. So labetalol is a nice drug to give as beta blocker. Nitro is also used. And we always check blood pressure. Now infectious disease of the heart, where I have endocarditis, um, patients who have history of IV drug abuse or have had surgery can develop this. It's an inflammation of the interior lining of the heart. And in severe cases, it requires surgery. <clears throat> 
pericarditis is an inflammation of the pericardial sac. And usually patients respond well to NSAIDs or antibiotics, but they need hospitalization. Myocarditis, now we're talking about the myocardium, the functional area of the heart. This can lead to some irregularities in heart, heart rates, dysrhythmias, and can be lethal. Rheumatic fever is an inflammatory disease, and it's brought on by the internalization of Streptococcus aureus, and it's a very dangerous disease because this bacteria should not be inside. You find staph uh, more external with skins, but getting it internal can lead to that rheumatic fever that can cause cardiovascular compromise. Then we have our scarlet fever, which is Streptococcus, where we have sore throat. What brings on a scarlet fever, gives its name, is the strawberry tongue appearance. And these patients require, um, it's highly contagious, so be very careful when you're treating them and make sure that like you are wearing gloves and you put them on a non breather, give that negative pressure mask that helps with any droplet contamination transference. Um, but also there, there's stories about how they, they would, for kids, they would throw out all their toys because it just stays with you. It's highly communicable. So understanding cardiology, understanding respiratory is vital to being a paramedic. I hope this lecture helped to renew your understanding of the cardiovascular system. And please, with 12 leads, you need to practice, 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 stay updated on the new science and just feel comfortable and have that standard approach just like you do with all of your patients. And please, make sure that you incorporate 12 lead early in your assessment modalities and you will, you will actually have a better overall outcome for your patients. Thank you.